explain to me what IRR is in two, in two line, uh, in one or two lines in English without doing the mathematics. Explain to me what IRR is. Not FIR, but IRR. You prefer FIR or IRR? Which one? Okay, tell me what what is IRR? IRR is the internal rate of return. Is the internal rate of return then? Yes, fine. That's an expansion of the acronym. Now here, I want to know whether people at the back, Ishan, can you see anything in this project? You can read project IRR, but the symbols, can you see? You don't have to read one, two, and three, but can you see the basic structure of that? Yes, sir. No, I'm asking Ishan. Everybody else is not relevant. Can you see? Not clearly. Not clearly. So let's try and make it a little bigger. Little better now? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, I think we'll deal. This is fine. Prachi, can you see? Okay, you can see the CF0 and all that stuff. Okay, good. So we'll deal with this now. Now, now you can see some of the maths of it here, but I want you to answer in English. Give me play, give me in one or two English sentences. What is meant by IR, what is IRR? Internal rate of return you gave me the expansion. But now explain to me in English. I don't want to deal with maths. You already have a mathematical clue already in front of you, but I'm just asking you, but this also you should remember in your head that this is what it is, right? So who else? Satyam, are you going to help us? Is my question clear? I just want to know in one or two English sentences, tell me what is, what is IRR other than the fact that the expansion is internal rate of return, but one or two English sentences, uh, or let me, let me make it even easier. Explain IRR to me in terms of NPV. One minute, quiet guys. Nikhil is getting another shot at it. Is my question clear? Explain IRR to me in terms of NPV. Is, is the question clear? Okay. Yes. Okay, you're timed out. Now Satyam, is my question clear? Explain IRR in terms of NPV. So pass. Pass. <laughs> oh, Dharam. What about you? Why not Dharam? No, pass. The no, Goyal. Okay, Goyal, tell me. Sir, uh, IRR is the rate of return an investor wants on the investment he makes, he makes during the initial period of period zero. No, now the question has been modified. The question is now, explain IRR to me in one or two English sentences in using NPV in the definition. Sure, uh, now is my question clear? Yes, sir. <coughs> okay, give it to Akshit. Redeem, redeem himself. Yes, for not coming late. Yeah. IRR is the rate of return at which NPV is zero. Okay, so you are quite close, but uh, your wording is again not correct. Okay, so what Akshat is saying is IRR is the rate of return at which the NPV is zero. Okay, so he uh, what he should have said is actually IRR is the discount rate. Discount rate. IRR is the discount rate which, if used to discount the project cash flows, will produce an NPV of zero. Is this correct? That is what you should have said. Okay, so it's not rate. So and then eventually you look at that as the when you get the when you do the IRR calculation, you see the uh, rate of return. But actually, what you should have said that you should have used the word discount rate and the project cash flow. So you should have referred to the project cash flows or any assets cash flows, which uh, if discounted at the IRR, that will produce an NPV of zero. Is everyone clear now? Yes, sir. Okay. So now we can see clearly that at least two or three students are not at least three students are not clear about this basic stuff which I'm sure would have been covered in FM1 and FM2? Yes or no? Yes, sir. It was covered in FM1, FM2? Yes, sir. Okay. So now you see that basic stuff is not clear. Okay. So, uh, okay. Now, one now second question. So basically, uh, so IRR typically you have learnt in the case of projects, but many, uh, uh, many uh, funds also look, talk about their IRR. So you should be uh, you able to apply that concept even in. So IRR essentially can be applied with respect to the returns to discuss the returns of any uh, asset, any investment in any asset. Okay, this is what we are coming to in this discussion because I think when you study the stuff in FM1 and FM2, 
because of the way it's organized in the chapters you would have uh, looked at project IRR in a separate session or a se separate module then you would have looked at uh, bond YTM in a separate bond returns in a separate module and stock valuation dividend growth uh, dividend discount in a separate module am I right you would have studied this kind of separately so we will try to see how everything is the same so IRR is something can be used not uh, that can be used not just for project but for any asset for evaluating the returns on any asset okay and typically what you would do is so remember this concept of hurdle rate also we discuss hurdle rate remember yes. you must have discussed it when you did FM1 FM2 yes. right Gupta is looking blank hurdle rate yes. remember from the Olympics hurdles yes. hurdle rate so hurdle rate is what you use as a that's an internal company benchmark so if you see that the IRR is in excess of the hurdle rate what do you do you reject the project or you accept the project okay so that is one of the ways in which you use the IRR okay and so just also be mindful that many private equity firms also when they discuss the returns to their investors they use IRR as the so default like blue water and like and hurdle rate if the investment return is below that then the person will not get the piece no it's not blue water it's high water okay <laughs> so you are confusing it with blue ocean strategy you might have done blue ocean strategy in strategy marketing or strategy you would have done blue ocean strategy so it's high water okay so high water mark okay that is not strictly speaking don't think of high water mark as it uh, it, it as uh, related to hurdle because a hurdle rate typically is something that does not change very often okay but a high water mark will keep on changing depending on what is happening to the investment okay so like if you see this is a high water if you see if you imagine this is not dollar swiss but the returns of an investment then uh, this when the funds started falling this was the high water mark and then when it's, it's still below that then when it finally goes over here then it has created a new high water mark so if you look at this as the returns of a fund so the, should not think of high water mark as being related to high hurdle rate because there, there's some important qualitative differences high water mark keeps on changing as the fund returns move up and down whereas hurdle rate is much more static it does change but maybe once in two years or something like that okay so uh, so IRR is clear to everybody now okay just to make sure now who's gonna tell us uh, Ayushi uh, if you look at if you compare you know what is a bonds YTM yeah okay now uh, give her the mic now you look at this project IRR formula and this bond YTM formula can you tell us something about the mathematical relationship between the two Sahil Goel is not allowed to answer this question because we have already discussed this question okay is my question clear Ayushi it's what happened the top formula the one on the top the one on the top is the project IRR formula which you should be able to recognize I just want I have to make sure I fit everything into the same screen okay now can you uh, so can you see that CF0 and all that so when you do the project this is the co they have already mentioned this is the initial investment the cost of the project okay and these are actually the project cash flows the present values of the project cash flows which you have added up okay and this is how you write it okay so the NPV is equal to zero when the discount rate is this the, the IRR is the discount rate which when applied to the project cash flows will produce an NPV of zero given the cost of the project okay so now you know now I'm showing you a new equation which is bond YTM which you have also seen right yes you, yes or no you've seen it okay now can you give me some uh, uh, insight into uh, is there any kind of similarity or are they the same are they not the same are they equal unequal greater than lesser than can you is my question clear mathematically from a mathematical perspective can you say something about what is the relationship between these two I don't know if my question is clear yes, sir. my question is clear yes, sir. I just want you to say something about uh, this like if I take this geodisc can I take another geodisc say maybe uh, Chadda has a geodisc and I compare these two then you'll have to say that they are identical <coughs> okay they would be identical but then if there is some other reliance uh, old reliance com dongle then you compare the two then you say no these are not identical okay although they serve the same function okay so so in that sense can you tell us something <coughs> okay I understand the question is not 100% maybe not 100% clear but I think you get the drift of what I'm saying 
can you comment on like can you comment on the mathematical uh, properties of these two equations anything chadda is moving his fingers left and right any any insight just say so the point is here see nobody is going to shoot you if you give a wrong answer so you just say whatever comes to your mind you know yes no plus minus doesn't matter it's it's yes who is answering achal one minute one minute achal achal has been briefed by sahil yes ishan <laughs> let's hear from ishan Sorry, before he falls asleep let's let's hear from ishan give him the mic quickly give ishan the mic <laughs> Yes. So in this YTM is equal to IRR. YTM is equal to IRR. Okay. Why? Can you explain to me a little more, a uh, little more clearly? Input equal to output. Yeah. Which is input and input. But here I see a problem here on the LHS. I see a zero over there. That means you are comparing these two, right? One minute. You are comparing this thing here, this first equation here, with this second equation here. and they are saying the same right but i am little confused because on the, in the first equation i see that lhs is equal to 0 here lhs is equal to 0 but here lhs is not equal to 0 is bond price which is something which is the market price of the bond so it can't be 0 i mean it can be 0 the bond has gone to totally worthless the company has defaulted but normal bond price uh, will not be 0 so this is some are you for, i understand what you said you said that they are the same inflow is equal to bond price inflow is equal to bond price okay i get that you are talking about the second equation yes. now why does that your your first statement is that this the two are the same i r r and y r c same okay okay here you have said about the second equation you are making a comment that the inflow is equal to bond price yes. okay the correct way to i understand what you are trying to say but the correct way to have said that would have been that the present value of the returns from the bond okay the present value of the returns from the investment in the bond is equal to the uh, bond price okay which is the market price of the bond is this clear lhs that's what you should have said but i understand that's what you meant okay now but i'm still confused because here the bond price is uh, uh, on the lhs is a, there's some bond price which is some positive quantity but here the lhs is zero so why are you saying what you're saying are you following what i'm saying yes Yeah. Now explain my. I mean, clear up my confusion. You are proceeding okay. I, I understand the first part of what you said on the second equation. Now I gave you my confusion. Now please clear my confusion. <laughs> you. Okay. Here's a clue. Normally, when you put this, when you mention the CFO, the CF, not O, CF zero. Okay. What kind of sign does it have? Plus or minus? Minus. minus. It has a minus sign. Because of investing. So outflow. 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 It's a. It has a minus sign. Yes. So can you take it to the left LHS? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So if you take it to the LHS, then they start looking similar. Positive. Do they look the similar? Uh, do they look similar now? Yes. If you imagine that we take the CFO, I mean not the CFO, <laughs> but the CF zero. we take the cf0 because it has a negative sign it has to have a negative sign because you can't get a uh, you're not going to get paid to uh, you know uh, get given a project so whoever makes the project for you will charge you money so this is shown as a negative sign so we can take it to the lhs now if we take this to the lhs imani are you following yes are you following okay so now if we take it then the two the equations do the two equations look similar yes yes or no they look the same yes, yes guy yes sir now they look the same yes, now let's look at it now that they are looking the same can we equate bond price as the market price of the bond that means if you wanted to buy the bond this is what you would have to pay okay this is actually what is called the clean price did you do a crude interest and clean price and dirty price of bonds So no, when you did bond pricing you did not do clean price dirty price accrued interest no. okay so this actually bond price i should write this so that later on you do your own research and figure it out if you read this this was a very good website this matter.com okay his taxonomy might differ a little bit from mine so you use my taxonomy but whatever he writes he will not write any wrong stuff it's good good website for you to learn 
finance okay zax is also a good website so bond price is you should you need to know this uh, market bond price okay is usually what is called the clean price clean price means without accrued interest if you buy a bond between coupon dates remember the bonds have coupon dates okay because it's a bond market security it's not a money market security so it will have a discrete coupon so let's say a bond is paying coupons every six months okay then if you buy the bond between coupon dates you understand what a coupon date is the date on which the coupon is paid okay so if they're paying coupons on uh, you know 30 30th of june all right and then they'll pay another coupon on 31st december okay so if you buy the let's say you buy the uh, bond that particular bond you buy in say october so what will happen is you will buy the bond now you will eat the whole coupon when it gets paid in december you understand suppose i bought the bond from sina sina was holding the bond he enjoyed the june coupon but then he sold me the bond in october and i bought it in october now what what happens is that the coupon that gets paid will be paid to the holder as of december so on 31st December, I will eat the whole six month coupon, but Sina actually uh, deserves the first few coupon, uh, first few months until October when he sold me the bond. You remember, you understand this? That he was holding the bond till October. So the coupons on the bond till October are actually owed to him, mm. but I will eat the whole coupon because the coupon will be paid to the guy who's or who is the uh, holder of record in December are you following yes, because the bond trustee does not know that I bought the bought the bond from him okay so what happens is when prices are quoted for bo in bond markets like you see this bond price over here so there is this concept of clean price and dirty price the clean price is the price without accrued interest and then I should write dirty prices with uh, accrued interest okay so what will happen is dirty price is with accrued interest so what will happen is suppose the bond price is let's say the bond price is uh, uh, let's say 102 dollars okay and let's say the accrued interest between june and october is let's say uh, 1.5 dollars okay so then what will happen is so if i if the bond price that is quoted in the market is the clean bond price okay it does not include the accrued interest so even in october when the bond price is being quoted as 102 okay 102 dollars that is actually the clean price so when i actually buy the bond from sinha in october let's say the accrued interest up from june to october is one and a half dollars mm -hmm. then i will actually have to pay him 102 plus 1.5 dollars okay. so i'll have to pay him 103.5 dollars is everyone clear yes. okay so when you buy the bond so it's a simple concept of bond prices as, as quoted in markets are the clean price which means they do not include the accrued interest because many transactions can happen between coupon dates are you following again i'm getting that same uh, you know walking dead zombie look from everybody are you following what i'm saying if you're not following it should you should interrupt and ask me the question i didn't follow this <coughs> tushar are you following no so whose responsibility is it to raise your hand and say I didn't follow you're not feeling well you want to go home okay let's ask somebody who's feeling well okay Rahul are you following what I'm saying yes okay so bond price now everybody understands bond price all you have to understand now is only new one new insight has been given that the bond prices quoted in markets are clean prices which means they do not include the accrued interest and what is accrued interest is whenever you buy bonds between coupon dates which can happen very frequently all right so it does not include the accrued interest between the last coupon date and the transaction date of the date on which you buy the bond is this clear okay so therefore the seller the buyer has to pay to the seller in addition to the market price of the bond he has to pay the accrued interest on the bond between the last coupon date and the transaction date of the bond of the bond purchase is this clear to everyone simple concept okay now so this bond price that is quoted that's the difference so clean price is the price without accrued interest these are the two terms you need to know and the dirty price is the one which includes the accrued interest so when the final consideration is paid from the buyer to the seller that will have to be the dirty price okay because the seller will not part with the bond unless he also gets the accrued interest is this clear to everyone okay so now we are going back to what we were discussing
where did we leave it okay so we have the bond price so this is the market price of the bond okay mm -hmm. all right okay this is the clean price of the bond so this just let's forget about clean and dirty now for the moment we'll just focus on this is the market price of the bond now we already moved the cf0 to the negative side to the lhs okay so you have to imagine it i can't do it here okay you have to imagine that this is good so now they look like the same thing okay now in this equation what is on the right hand side so on the left hand side in the second equation is the cost of investing in the bond is it fair to say that is the market price of the bond is the cost of including ignoring the dirty price aspect of it? is the cost of investing in the bond okay now here on the left hand side we have brought this here can we say that here also on the LHS we have the cost of investing in the project yes Pranav is not convinced my second first statement you agree bond price is the cost of investing in the bond now in the first equation I brought the CF of 0 to the left hand side because it has a negative sign so now can I say that the first equation also in the, the LHS is showing you the cost of investing in this particular project yes sir. is that fair yes, sir. okay all right now on the right hand now let's go back to the second equation what do we see on the right hand side as Ishan pointed out we see the present value of the returns from that particular bond from investing in that bond is that clear okay now what we go now we go here because remember this has moved to this side so here what do we see in the first equation on the right hand side yeah no I can't hear somebody is speaking in Hindi I can't hear but it's not loud enough Sir, what will be the cash flow of the first year from the <coughs> solid cash flow? Is it only the first year? All years. All years. All years. All years. All yeah. So, so again, can we say that the right hand side of the first equation is also showing the present value of the returns from investing in the project? Yes, sir. Is that a fair statement? Yes, sir. Okay, so then can we see that IRR and MT, uh, um, YTM, I was going to say MTV. Okay, <laughs> so IRR and YTM are the, can we see that mathematically they are the same? Sir, Many people are not. Sir, Vibhu, are you convinced? Uh, you are convinced? But let's see some more conviction. Like, you're convinced is like you're almost falling asleep as you say convinced. Sir, purpose is one minute, one minute. So, is Vibhu convinced yes. that mathematically they are the same? Anybody who is not in agreement, if please make sure you understand this. Yes, are you? Uh, sorry, Arihat. Yeah. I didn't give you why IRR equal to YTM. Where you explain? IRR equal to YTM means in the mathematically the two are essentially the same. That's what we are trying to show here. Okay. Because if you take C, one sec. If we now, if we forget about this bond and project business, if we forget about this bond and project business, let's just use a general term called asset. Both are assets. Can we say that a project is also an asset? A bond is also an asset. Both will appear on the asset sites. If the company decides to go ahead and invest in a bond or in a project, both will appear on the asset side. Both are assets. So in general terms, okay, if we look at uh, the, uh, if we uh, uh, replace project and bond with uh, uh, asset okay in the first equation we are seeing that uh, the IRR what we see in our rearranged first equation where the CF0 is on the left hand side okay we can see that the IRR is the discount rate which uh, if used to discount the returns from the project okay will uh, create a, a present value for the project returns equal to the cost of investing in the project is this clear Okay, now same thing when we go into the second equation, what we can see, so yeah, yeah, okay, all right, okay, so in the second equation also, what are we seeing in, now we are trying to see the equivalence in English, in the English language, we are trying to see the equivalence, that on the right hand side, again, we see that what is this, this is just the sum of the present values of the returns uh, from investing in the bond, okay, and then we see that uh, so, so the, we see that YTM is the discount rate, okay, which if used to discount the uh, returns from the from the investment in the bond is going to create a present value for the bonds returns, okay, which is equal to the cost of investing in the bond. Is this clear? So now you see why they are the same, okay. 
they are essentially the same because essentially it's the same. if you wanted to uh, say describe it in english you would say that it is the discount both of them are discount rates which used to which if used to discount the returns on any asset will produce a present value for the sum uh, of for the returns okay equal to the cost of investing in that asset okay are you following here now long and complicated english sentence you have to be careful do the function standing with a gun every time i stand every time i utter a long and complicated english sentence i have to look at the function and see whether he is ready to fire his gun or not but this is how we have to say it okay it is important because see most of these concepts you have to understand it they, they will sound complicated it's not going to be easy okay because you come to do an mba and one of the important goals of an mba is to equip you with a conceptual uh, with a set of conceptual frameworks which you can then go and apply in the real world to solve business problems okay otherwise you don't really need i mean if uh, i mean to solve a lot of people can solve business problems without doing an mba they just have the frameworks in their head okay or maybe they don't even need the frameworks but if you are going to do an mba you are going to have to learn those conceptual frameworks that is why every time i show you a specific example i also force you to look at the theory like we were looking at the swap and i made you remember original i mean underlying position hedge position because that framework you have to the way you get it into your brain drilled into your brain is every time you see a specific example you have to be forced to apply the framework to analyze that example that's how the framework gets into your head are you following okay all right so we have understood this point hopefully you've learned something because i don't think everybody was clear about this in the beginning right so mathematically they are the same satyam and nikhil now you are more and like more enlightened okay good okay so uh, so so now a few other important points about bonds which are very basic stuff okay which you should know all right so you've learned about clean price and dirty price okay now another question is if a bond now you know what a ytm ytm is nothing but the market yield on the bond okay the ytm is the market yield on the bond okay so now if i say that if a bond you know what par value is everybody knows what par value of a bond is it's a redemption value okay is the value on which your interest are going to be interest rate is going to be uh, you know interest rate is going to be applied to that par value to determine the curve so the bond is trading below par then ytm okay now you tell me greater lesser is the question clear if the bond is trading below par means market price is below par everyone understands what par is now lesser okay so now if the bond is trading below par then ytm will be less than the coupon okay let's write why ytm what happened here okay all right so ytm is trading you are saying that this should be less than the coupon rate and so therefore if a bond is trading above par Then therefore, this should be greater. Yes. Sir. Okay. Everyone is in agreement with this. Okay. Just think about this. If a bond is trading above par, okay, what does it mean? The YTM is the market yield. Okay. The YTM is the market yield. Let's put this here. YTM is the market yield. desired on the bond okay and that is what basically all right and so what you guys are saying if the market is trade if the bond is trading above par okay who is who is who gave the answers here on this question the pankshu explain to me why i don't understand this logic is my question i just want to understand i am not able to follow why this answer should be given why why this is the right answer now explain to me the ytm is the market's desired yield on the bond okay all right now is is uh, another thing that you know is this one also right uh, let's put this statement over here let's put this statement over here we have one more statement which we can make
which is that if the uh, if the coupon uh, if the bond is trading at par then the ytm is equal to the coupon okay that is another statement which we should have discussed okay but uh, we can take that as a first statement then you guys have added two statements now the punctu explained to me i am not able to follow the last two statements i am able to follow so explain to me logically why uh, if a bond is trading below par okay then the ytm is less than the coupon i am not able to follow this logic explain to me step wise so if the bond is trading below use the mic use the mic give him the mic who is holding the mic yeah give him the mic let's capture it on the mic yes is my question clear i'm not able to follow i follow the first part i follow that if a bond is trading at par then the ytm is equal to the coupon rate this part i follow but the second part when you are saying if a bond is trading below par then the ytm is less than the coupon rate i'm not able to follow this can you explain to me step wise if a bond is trading below par that means that demand for uh, the bond in the market is less okay uh, so, so what does that mean so the investors would not be interested for in trading in a bond if the yield is less on the bond then then how will the market clear because the when you are trading when you are saying market is the bond is trading below par it is trading right there is a market price so there is a market price mean the market is clearing you are saying that if the market price is below par okay then the ytm is less than the coupon what is ytm we have already explained what ytm is so the return on the bond ytm is the yield that the market desires on the bond this is clear so tushar and who is his buddy there shivam i am not talking i'm not talking to you bola bola and all is not required we just need to see you active we had not opened the cp sheet uh, but you have made us open the cp sheet today okay what happened now there's still a lot of noise coming from that side are you guys on the same team that is okay but your face was turned to it so the right response in my classes if somebody talks to you just ignore them look straight sir he was asking like a horse with blinkers now you know it's betting season no you can see the horses you just horse with blinkers look straight sir he was asking the question i am not interested in what he was asking the question but what he was asking okay this is archer's team you are ratcheting up your scores okay now where is shivam shivam is in kriti's team oh both of you are competing with each other okay all right okay all right let's go back to the problem so is my question clear i understand that if the bond is trading at par then the market price is equal to par the par value of the bond that means that the ytm and the coupon are the same now let, we are talking about a first situation where the market price is now follow everyone follows this a bond is trading below par means market price is below par is that clear to everyone do i need to write that yes or no no sir okay this is clear okay so in bond market bond is trading means now we are saying market we are looking at the relationship we are looking at the relationship between the market price the par value the ytm and the coupon rate is this clear this is what we are discussing now so we have said that if the market price is equal to the par value then we say that the coupon rate is equal to the ytm is this first step clear and we also know that other thing to understand is that the ytm is essentially the yield that the market desires of the bond okay so now if you see that a bond is trading below par now uh, you are saying that then that means that the ytm is less than the coupon yes, so i am not able to follow this can you explain to me step wise for example if there is a bond 8% us dollar bond right so the coupon rate is 8% okay now the market has just but i am not feeling well okay go now the market has decided that the rate is 6.5% let's see so the coupon rate is 8% yeah and you are saying that let's say the market has decided the ytm is 6.5% okay so in that case the bond will be traded below par because the returns are not uh, the returns are not expected uh, by the market that it will be what the coupon rate is given 
Anybody else? Is anyone convinced by this example yeah. given to Shivani? So the sign should be opposite. It should be the opposite of what you guys have said? Yes, sir. Okay, now explain it. Shivani will explain to us why she doesn't agree with the Pangshu. <laughs> Practice when you go to, you are going to HDFC Bank. Yes, sir. So you have to explain to your colleagues in the bank. Yes. Uh, imagine that you are explaining to your colleagues in the bank. Now explain it. So, for example, the uh, market price rate of the bond is 100 and we have purchased the bond, uh, bond below the power rate, that is 90, for example. And the uh, coupon rate is 10% Okay. and we get the coupon uh, uh, like for the at the power price, that is 10 rupees. Okay. Of the 100, 10% of the 100. And we have purchased the bond for the 90 rupees, okay. that is we are getting more for our uh, investment. Correct. Therefore, okay. the uh, uh, sign should be opposite. Okay, correct. So Shivani has given the correct answer actually. That so she, she has given a very good explanation also. Ten percent, and you are saying let us whatever it is eighty percent, eight percent or whatever it is. Okay, if the market rate is eight percent, okay. So this this should be then actually the YTM here. The example that we should give is that uh, over there you said okay I okay, I'm not giving the example correctly, but obviously what now you understood what she said. Let's keep that. Obviously this has to be. If bond is trading below par, okay, then the YTM should be something like 10% and the coupon can be 8%. Uh, 8% okay, what she actually de demonstrated is that if you follow this first logic, which is a negative return, it will uh, it will lead to an absurd result. What she's actually saying is that we don't get a we don't get a return that is less than the coupon. We actually get a return higher than the uh, we get a return that is higher than the YTM if you follow this logic. Okay, so uh, let me just explain it one more time. So this should be sorry. Both are below par. Yeah, I'm going to wipe out the first one. I'm going to wipe out the first one because the first one was not correct, obviously. So as she correctly pointed out Second that this one sec, this will, so this will be, less. so if that is greater than this is obviously less. Now let's understand it one more time. Okay. <laughs> suppose that, uh, suppose that this uh, uh, actual coupon is uh, 8%. Okay. On the bond, the coupon is 8% and the market desires a yield of 10%. Mm. Okay, so if the market, so look at it stepwise, if the market desires a yield of 10% from that bond, okay, so because that's the yield now for those maturities, okay, and that credit risk. Now, if the market prices the bond at par, then if you remember, if what happens if you price the bond at par, par, the return you get is equal to the coupon rate, because if we already said in the previous relationship, in the previous relationship, in the line above, we have already said the starting point for the discussion is that when the bonds price, the market price of the bond is equal to the par value of the bond, then the coupon rate is equal to the YTN. Okay, let's please make sure that I think everybody is not clear with this example also. So the first thing that, that we are stating, the first statement we are making is that when we see that a mark, that the market price of the bond is equal to the par value of the bond. First of all, is everyone clear about par value? Everyone is clear? Nikita, you're clear about par value? Okay. So if now market price, everyone knows, coupon rate also everyone knows and YTM is, you have to think of YTM as the uh, desi market's desired yield on that bond. Okay. The YTM is going to be the yield that the market desires for that bond, for that maturity. Is this clear? Okay. So now the first statement is if that if the bond if the bond is trading at par that means the market price is equal to the par value then the YTM is equal to the coupon rate. There are all these things you have to try and understand intuitively. Okay. In some sense that's one of the reasons why I don't like to use too much maths in teaching finance because when you do maths sometimes you can switch off your brain and do maths because maths is like a black box. Once you write a partial differential equation that will automatically come out in a particular way. You don't need to really think about all the steps because those are all mechanical rules. You cannot think about new rules of solving, you know, equations because there are all rules of, you know, if you want to multiply matrices, you can't think of your own method of multiplying matrices. There is a standard method and that's what you have to follow. So mathematics sometimes can be like a black box. You understand what a black box is? Black box means uh, you put in some input and some output comes out like neural networks. 
all this uh, this new term that has come up for neural networks i think is machine learning okay is a new name for neural networks so this the problem one of the problems that these kinds of machine learning systems and trading and all this these are all black boxes you put in some input and you get some output but you don't really know how the input led to the output you can't see the process that's when you can't see the pro the, the process that's called a black box you put in an input you get an output but you can't really see the process of how the input led to the output. So a lot, in a lot of ways, you understand what I mean, but you guys have all done maths in school and college. A lot of the time you just do it like a black box because once you put it into the framework, it has to be, come out in a particular way, right? It is kind of fixed. So if you must think of finance, everything else you have to think of in terms of, uh, you have to think of it intuitively. Okay, think about conceptually. What happened? Pardon? Okay, okay, fine. No. All right, okay. So, uh, so I don't know if you lost me in that discussion. Are you following what I'm saying? All I'm saying is that uh, it is important to understand everything intuitively. If you understand it intuitively, logically, that is much more, uh, that is much clearer to you, okay? And it's much more durable, the understanding. So, the first part is clear. That is, every, if you have any problem with the first part, understand it logically why it should be so. Because if your bond, if the market price of the bond is equal to the par value of the bond, okay? That means we are saying that the market, market's desired yield on the bond is equal to the coupon rate on the bond, right? Because if you buy the bond at par, what will you get? If the bond's coupon is 8%, only coupon. then you'll get the 8% plus you'll get the principal also, right? So you will re realize an 8% return on the bond, okay? If you buy the bond, if you just think of it as a one-year if you think of it as a one-year debt instrument, to make it simple, think of it as a one-year fixed deposit kind of thing, your coupon rate is 8%, you will realize 8%. If you invest at 100 rupees at 100% of the deposit value, you will get a return of it, the same return equal to the coupon rate. Is this clear? The first statement, I want to, I need to get a... Okay, so give me that so that I can move to the next step. Now, my problem is I can't, unless I get a convincing response from the class, I can't move to the next step. Okay. Sir. Yes. But if uh, a person has uh, purchased the bond on par and now it is... At par. We don't say on par, we at say par. at par. And now it is trading below par. Yes, purchased at par and now it is trading at below par. So, sir, then YTM would be less than the coupon rate. No, then he has experienced a, no. so he has we are not talking about those kinds of situation in that case he has experienced a, for the moment he has experienced a capital loss a mark to market loss on the board we are not talking from that perspective we are talking from the perspective of a fresh Thank investor who is looking at investing a fresh in that particular bond okay so the first question statement is clear to everybody yes. if the coupon rate is equal at the if the market price and the and the par price, par value are the same then the coupon rate is equal to the ytm okay because the market is happy bond so the market is willing to buy at now imagine what happens is as she makes as uh, shivani mentioned okay that now what happens is forget about the first part here bond is trading below par now imagine that the market's desired yield for the bond goes from eight percent to ten percent okay earlier it was both eight percent so it was uh, trading at par now imagine that the market's desired yield on the bond goes to ten percent so market requires a ten percent yield for those kind of bonds for that majority now, how will the market, if the bar, think of it this way, if the peop, if the market still buys the bond at par, if the market price is still at par, that means people are still buying the bond at par, then they will realize only an 8% return. This is clear because there's the same thing, say market price equal to the par, par price, par value. What? No, responses are not. Nakpal, what is your phone saying? Below par or above par? Your phone is above par, I'm sure. <laughs> Okay, now please concentrate on all this stuff, okay, because otherwise what's the point of doing the class if, if people are not able to follow this kind of basic stuff which you should have already done in FM1 and FM2, okay. All right, guys, please pay attention now. Okay, are you for, if at any point you don't follow your responsibility is to raise your hand and ask a question, okay, like somebody asked a question, one or two people have asked questions, okay. So, now think of it this way why will the bond why will the market price go fall below par when the ytm rises above the coupon rate because see if the mark if the ytm has risen above the coupon rate which means that the market wants to realize a yield of 10 percent on this bond which is paying a eight percent coupon okay now when you buy the bond can you change the coupon no, sir. you can't change the coupon because it's already been issued right 
so the only thing you have to play with is the price there are only two ways you realize the return on the bond one is the coupon payments and the other is the principal okay either you buy it above par and you lose on the principal or you buy it below par and you gain on the principal so as the example that she gave that if you buy the bond at 90 percent of its par value then you will get some price appreciation because eventually the bond if there is no default the bond will redeem at 100 percent of par okay so therefore think of it logically now why the ytm if the ytm rises above the coupon rate then the market price will have to fall below the par value because that is the only way that that ytm can be realized by market investors because see think of it everything starts with the ytm because the ytm is the market interest rate okay so you issued a bond with the eight percent coupon okay when you issued it the market ytm was also eight percent now because of certain world conditions maybe inflationary expectations target real rate of return has gone up okay credit spreads have gone up okay now the ytm has risen to 10 percent but the coupon cannot be changed on the bond okay so there are only two ways for a bond investor to make sure that he realizes a 10 percent return on a bond which is paying a eight percent coupon okay there's only one way left now the bond is paying a coupon of eight percent if he buys it at par he will get only an eight percent return is that clear no. now the how will he make sure that his return goes to ten percent he will have to take a uh, he will have to buy it at a price below par so that the price appreciation from his market price to the redemption at par will provide him the extra return to take him from eight percent to ten percent is this clear yes, sir. now you are following Aryanth is still not convinced yes or no are you convinced not good but think of it this way see there are only two ways you can squeeze a return from a bond either from the coupon okay or from the price appreciation okay if you take a purer form of a money market instrument which doesn't even have a coupon that gives you a clearer view of the fact that there the return is only from the price appreciation okay so now if you go into the world of coupon instruments and the bond market now you have two ways to make a return on the bond either from the coupon or from the price appreciation okay so here you can't do anything about the coupon because it has been set at eight percent so if you buy it at par you are only going to get an eight percent return but that's not good enough for you because you want a market rate of return so the market rate of return has now risen to 10 percent so what option is left to you there's only one option left to you you tell the bond you tell the guy who's selling the bond that I am not going to buy this bond for par. I am going to buy it at a discount to par value, at, and I will adjust the discount to ensure that my I get a return of a YTM of ten percent. So I am have I have to buy it at a price below the uh, below the par value, so that that extra appreciation from the market price which at which I buy to the par value, that appreciation will compensate me for the shortfall in the coupon relative to the YTM. Is everyone clear? Yes. Yes, you are saying clear. No, what is Shivani? Shivani is saying something. Okay, I thought the, I, I heard a female voice from that side. Okay, all right. Okay, so is everyone clear now? Are you following this logic? Think about it intuitively, and then it'll easier to understand, and it's also easier to retain. Bibu, you're clear. Okay, so therefore the logic. So therefore the thumb rule. So we are deriving many thumb rules, but you should know how to. If you forget the thumb rule, you should know how to work it back logically, right? This is how you should work it back logically. So now, obviously, since this is then the YTM will be greater than the coupon rate. Okay. And then obviously, then if the bond is trading above par, then the YTM is less than the coupon rate. Okay. All right. So we have learned three more things here that coup where so which is basically about the relationship between uh, bond price market price of the bond par value of the bond. Uh, coupon rate of the bond and the YTM on the bond. Is this clear? Now everybody should have understood this so well that you are never going to forget it in your life. Okay. <coughs> All right. So uh, we also learned about clean price, dirty price. You can read this website later on. For you can also read Zacks is also a good site if you are interested. They used to give free copies of uh, equity research reports. I don't know if they still do, but you can read at, uh, equity research reports maybe um, at Zacks. Okay, so here there is a little note on the relationship between YTM and IRR and all that, but we have already discussed all that. This is just for your reading. Okay, so now we go back to our so the entire discussion that was happening here so far was on the 
um, the entire coverage of the financial services sector so we went into a long discussion of the debt capital markets and how they work in conjunction with the swap markets because we uh, looked at started looking at the government treasury which issues debt so we have only one category of investor uh, on one category of uh, player left which is the corporate treasury uh, which is we are just calling we are just going to use a short word like the cfo okay um so uh we are going to just look at their notes the their uh situation now did i discuss this with you guys did i discuss this framework no, no, sir. no never okay so i think there's a there's a there is a fold there is a in notes i think that is v4 yeah so let me just go to v4 instead of v3 same concept so this we will go through very quickly because uh, we have already um, uh, okay so I did not discuss this with you but this is nothing this is just a framework which shows you that uh, the uh, it tries to show you the objectives a uh, firms of firm objectives versus the CFO and the role of the CFO or the treasurer okay so now look at this let me just delete this one this is V version 3 okay all right now here what we have is very simple i'm just going to try and go through this very quickly you can study it later on your own and uh, just get a feel of it uh, which is just meant to show you what happens in a uh, the uh, in a in a treasury okay so here you see the firm what i'm trying to show here is that the firm every firm is lost between uh, every firm is uh, you know caught in a tussle uh, between uh, trying to make a return okay and these are all for-profit organizations they are caught in a tussle what is trying to show you here is that the competing uh, objectives of the firm on the one hand it has to grow earnings okay is this clear one of the objectives of the firm obviously is to grow earnings why is there so much noise <laughs> the door is not properly just see if the door is properly closed okay they have been released 15 minutes early okay so the competing objectives of the firm just try to make sure that you understand this framework okay that the firm is complete so the firm has two objectives on the one hand it has to grow earnings so to grow earnings it has to do what take re increase risk or reduce risk <laughs> increase risk because returns come with risk okay if you don't take risk you don't get return so what i'm trying to show here is that in order to grow earnings it has to increase risk okay but it cannot just try to grow earnings like kingfisher and then end up in that kind of situation so it has another objective also which is to stay solvent you understand what solvency is the ability to pay its debts as they come due so you don't want to end up in a kingfisher or a suzlon kind of situation so therefore it has to also stay solvent now to stay solvent uh, to focus on staying solvent it has to reduce risk or increase risk reduce risk okay so you can see that every firm is is caught in this kind of balance it's a delicate balance that they have to uh, on the one hand they have to increase risk to grow earnings on the other hand they have to try and reduce risk to stay solvent to make sure that things are under control okay that's why you see many firms sometimes they go into downsizing okay like GE G is now going for a lot of divestitures okay because GE is now suddenly in a lot of uh, facing a lot of problems okay so what they are doing is they are reducing risk by selling off assets okay because they want to ensure that they don't go bankrupt under any circumstances or they don't have a even down a credit downgrade so this is just a way just a way of showing the con conflicts uh, that the firm faces okay now when you grow earnings there are two ways to grow earnings what is the difference between organic and inorganic growth who's going to tell us Tanuj can you tell us haven't you heard these terms you heard these terms okay so that which cannot tell us one minute one minute one minute one minute let him talk can you tell us the difference between organic and inorganic growth use the mic where's the mic no explain explain properly say organic growth is abcd inorganic growth is one two three four say something in that format yes passing front of <laughs> can you tell us the difference between organic and inorganic growth no you want to go okay fine so the puncture is going he's the one who's going today every day one person can go 
uh, if there is not, not every day one person should go, but uh, if there is some kind of urgency, I'll let you leave 15 minutes before. Yes, Pranav? Can you tell us the difference between organic and inorganic growth? You guys have studied it? Yes. Some are saying yes, some are saying no. You have studied it? Why can't you answer Akanksha? Help us. Give her the mic. Give the mic to Akanksha. Be quiet, everybody else. Yeah. So, a firm grows organically through its normal course of business and certain inorganic growth mergers and acquisition Darwin. Okay, good. So, Aja, double A, come here. Come and sit in the punctual seat. We want to see you working on your laptop. Okay, good. So, so what we are trying to show here is... Yeah, okay, guys, please, quickly, let's finish this job. Okay. So, as Akanksha explained, in organic growth, what you have to do, what you, uh, in, what you have is, you just grow by expanding your own operations. Okay, so like if you think of Cafe Coffee Day setting up new outlets, okay, as long as they're all CCD outlets that they're setting up, that is an example of organic growth. They're setting up new outlets in new locations, okay. Now, if Cafe Coffee Day buys Costa Coffee, that Costa Coffee already has its own set of outlets, okay, so that is an example of inorganic growth that is growing through acquisitions, okay, mergers, acquisitions, etc. So this is basically all we are showing here is that earnings can be growth in both uh, grown in both ways organic growth or inorganic growth okay now what the objective of this is basically also to show you what kind of roles you have in a corporate treasury what kind of roles because this whole module is the entire long module is about the different kinds of functions that different firms perform in the economy and associated with that there are the roles that people will perform which basically gives you an idea of the kind of roles that are available in finance now the ones the the functions performed by uh, the uh, CFO uh, unit is uh, is uh, these are given here okay the ones in yellow and the ones in uh, blue there is sign over there okay so now what that coloring the blue coloring there on tax legal and regulatory is because MBAs normally get the, don't get those jobs okay those jobs you have to be either a lawyer or an accountant which is a separate professional degree so normally MBAs don't get hired into those functions. So these are this through this uh, uh, you know portrayal of the firm and its conflicting objectives. You are seeing the role of the uh, CFO. Okay. So what the CFO does is uh, one obviously on the stay solvent side it takes care of all tax, legal, regulatory matters. Okay. Uh, all these things, but these jobs are not given to MBAs. They are given to professionally qualified lawyers, accountants, etc. Okay. Other things that the, the CFO the unit does, I'm going to just raise this picture a little bit. Okay, one is this thing called cash management. Okay, cash management essentially is, uh, it will focus more on the solvency side. Cash management essentially means all kinds of stuff like, have you heard things like pooling? Have you heard of things like pooling? Cash pooling, where you have multiple accounts and you try to arrange uh, the, uh, the money into one account. Okay, so so these kinds of things, these are all, there are many many ways to optimize your cash flows because your business units are throwing up cash flows. Some are throwing up cash flows, some are sucking up cash flows. So managing all the movement of cash, there's a lot of optimization that can be done here. Okay, so what is happening here? There's some activity going on here between all the heads which are down, Ria and who else? Who is next to Ria Ridhima? Is there some activity going on? Okay. All right. Now let's focus on uh, let's focus on uh, understanding this. So cash management is one of the important roles of uh, one of the important roles of uh, the CFO. Okay. Optimizing all the cash balances. Okay. The second is risk management, which you have an understanding of already from your project in the previous. Uh, you have an understanding from your IFM project. What is involved in risk management? Clear? What? I seem to have lost everybody here. Are you following what I'm trying to show you here? Okay. All right. So, in so risk management, the role of the so obviously risk management is more connected to which one? Staying solvent or growing earnings? Risk management as a function of the CFO of the Treasury. Okay, let's call it the Treasury. Of, in the, as a treasury function risk management is one of the treasury functions okay that is related to which of the goals of the firm staying solvent or growing earnings staying, staying, solvent. staying solvent obviously because if you don't control your risk 
if you like what you guys did in your project if you are holding a bunch of inventory and then you don't manage the risk on the inventory the all commodity prices fall then your copper inventory oil inventory gold inventory everything will suffer massive losses then your accountant will come and say you have to do an inventory revaluation and you will have to show that loss in your pnl <coughs> right so you will have a big problem in your uh, reporting right so you have to manage the risk so that is related to solvency okay so therefore risk management is a very important function of the cfo of the treasury okay so th these are the functions of the firm as related so these are the functions that the cfo does the treasury does cash management risk management and then of course the most important function which is capital raising okay that is the most important function of the treasury which you already have a feeling for now you have a good understanding of debt markets and you can see how uh, when we were looking at uh, debt markets in connection with the swap markets which two functions were being combined these things in yellow and green and uh, yellow and blue these are all the functions of this of the treasury okay so my question is capital raising you understood when we discussed debt markets we were talking about capital raising is that clear okay we were talking about the capital is the, the most important function of the treasury by far capital raising okay <laughs> so now when we were talking about debt capital markets and the use of uh, interest rate swaps and currency swaps in connection with debt issues which two functions of the treasury were being discussed is my question clear <coughs> with reference to this framework which shows you the functions of the treasury okay uh, when we were discussing debt capital markets the debt issuance remember we discussed all these bond issuance frn issuance combining it with interest rate swaps to achieve the desired liability profile you remember all that so when we were discussing those transactions which of the of the four of the five functions shown in this diagram there are five functions of the treasury shown in this diagram which of the two functions were being discussed in those discussions okay maybe the question is over complicated you still don't understand the question okay let me give you the answer, <laughs> the answer is, i was trying to show you the combination of the capital raising function with the risk management function remember because when we discussed that particular case of a company the xyz corp which is a british company which is only able to issue at floating rate dollars but it does not want to have floating rate dollar debt because its revenues are all in sterling <laughs> so therefore what it did was it issued debt in floating rate dollars and then did a cross currency irs converting that liability event to a net liability of fixed rate sterling you forgotten all of that no, what forgotten or not forgotten yeah, yeah. yeah. what you remember everyone has forgotten everyone else vibhu also remembers you don't remember good lord okay we just did that in the last class that's the one where we took such a long time to explain that and now everybody's forgotten the transaction yes you remember the chart where we had a dollar is every, anyone able to remember except for sahil no one remembers now you remember it okay so all i'm saying is okay maybe this is over complicated but again you have to understand these things conceptually they may under, they may look like they're over complicated questions but this is the kind of uh, this is the way that you have to study finance as an mba student you have to know the theoretical frameworks you need you need to know the right terms that you have to use okay so that when we were dis discussing when we were discussing that kind of a transaction we are actually looking at the two important functions of the treasury which is capital raising and risk management you understand why that swapping into fixed rate sterling is a risk management function answer no, you understand that now sir, because it is a form of hedging so hedging falls under the risk management function yes, sir. so now are you able to follow what i'm saying yes, sir. that when you are issuing in fixed in floating rate dollars everyone is looking at the clock now i'm already counting like five six <laughs> faces who have looked at the clock okay that clock is 5 minutes fast yes, yes. okay so all we are saying is that if we have now tarun is already getting ready to leave okay packing so the, all we are saying is that when you are discussing a debt market issue debt capital markets issuance along with a swap okay for a non financial corporation typically most of the time you are actually looking at how the capital raising function and the risk management function are being combined 
because we looked at that company which is uh, uh, a sterling based company let me just pull up the we have full five minutes i don't want to recap you have a class after this yes. Yes. good very good <laughs> I don't know what you're going to do in that class. If you're already falling asleep here, yes. but your your energy levels are very low for yes. such young people. Okay, all we are saying is we are just focusing on to bring this back. Although we spent the entire class almost yes, in the sir. previous class looking at this. Okay, but it's important to have this kind of conceptual understanding of uh, of because you all you guys are all this is all new stuff for you. You don't really know what the treasury does at all. So you need to have an understanding of what the core functions of a corporate treasury are. Okay, so you have capital raising, funding business units, which we have not yet come to and cash management and risk management okay along with tax legal regulatory which as i said the, so the mbas will get only these kinds of jobs in the corporate treasury okay mbas will get these kinds of jobs in the corporate treasury okay so now let's look at this what were we, what were we saying so everyone is clear that capital raising you understand what is meant by capital raising going into the ecm and dcm and raising money okay all right so what we are saying is when you see a corporation doing this that this xyz corp a british corporation please focus guys i want to see focus till the last minute okay so uh if i can sit here and holler for three uh, one and a half hours you guys which are like you're like less than half my age i think so you guys can at least have that much energy like concentrate on what is being taught okay so when you see this kind of transaction where xyz corp being a british corporation with sterling revenues revenues are only in sterling general risk management per principle is you should match your revenues with your uh, expenses the currency there should not be a currency mismatch between assets and liabilities that is not always possible but that's the desired outcome okay so prudent risk management principle so when you see a company has has been forced to issue in a us dollar floating rate uh, uh, segment of the debt market uh, although it is a sterling based uk corporate with only revenues with revenues only in sterling what they do is they combine the frn issuance in us dollars with a cross currency irs sterling dollar cross currency irs to convert their net liability the effective liability becomes fixed rate sterling because these two cash flows will cancel out they do a swap with stand chart forget about the left hand panel of this chart okay this we are only concerned with this stand chart and xyz corp this part is this clear to everyone yes. we already did this earlier now you bring the other conceptual art for it these are two important functions of the treasury raising capital and managing risk so they are doing it together in one transaction this is again an example of what we call swap driven issuance which is an important thing that you have to be aware of is this clear to everybody now you understand this okay so the last part now you can see how your program has trained you for some of these roles okay now capital raising risk management you have some idea about these things cash management we didn't really focus on much uh, but then uh, funding business units you remember you studied capital budgeting and your fm1 fm2 all this project appraisal no. irr all this stuff npv irr project analysis that is all related to this function funding business units because if you are a big corporate you will have a central cfo treasury which will receive the proposals from the different divisions and they will see which proposal has a positive npv which has a larger npv then they will give that as a priority allocation for funds is this clear so the function of the treasury is funding the business units and you have already acquired all the skills for that because you've done all your project appraisal and uh, and your NPV analysis, IRR analysis, etc. Is this clear? Yes. Clear now? Yes. You have learned so much that now I should set you free? Yeah. Yeah. Is that true? Let me see how much of a sin I am committing by setting you free. Uh, Five no, seconds. No, okay. No, okay. No, okay. No, okay, you can go. <laughs> Please make sure Rahul and Tanoj uh, and anybody else who has not done their job. If you don't submit by Tuesday midnight, I will deduct marks from your uh, grades. Yeah.